Hi, last time you saw me take a rough plank, cut it down and make some rough parts from it. Now I've finished making those rough parts and today what I'm going to do is take the rough parts and turn them into accurate parts. So getting rid of any bow, twist, cup etc that's happened since they've been resawn from the larger plank and also cutting them to exact sizes and dimensions. So join me and see how I do that. Now when I was breaking down the rough plank, uh, one of the things I did was produce two faces that were at 90 degrees to each other. And then I sawed uh, the boards off through there like so. Every time I took a board off, I uh, re-flattened this side and made sure it was at 90 degrees to the other face. And I was marking them with a pencil gauge, so giving myself a rough line to saw to. Today we're going to move from pencil gauge to a marking gauge with a little crescent knife in it. And that just gives us a much more accurate uh, part to plane to rather than saw to. Now one of the problems was, although we produced this lovely flat face that we were sawing off, when we took our component off there, we've released some different stresses and uh, originally that face was kept flat by all the stresses within that large plank. Uh, now we've removed a section of it, the stresses are different and you'll find that the boards you've taken off could well have cupped, bowed or twisted a little bit. That's why we cut them a little thicker, a little wider uh, than we actually need them. And the worst case, you could end up with something that's uh, bowed as much as that. And that uh, brings into question how we actually sort that one out. If we've cut reasonably close to our finished uh, thickness, removing all of that curve from the top and all of that curve from the bottom means we may end up with a board that's not thick enough for the job we want. And the first thing I would say about that is we're likely to have some joinery on the ends and the joinery is unlikely to be quite as thick as the rest of the component. So for example, when we're trying to flatten this curve at the top, we may not need to flatten any further than the shoulders for a tenon at each end. So we only need to take part of that off. And that difference may actually make the difference between having the right thickness at the end of the day um, to match the plans or having to throw that piece away and cut another piece. The best thing a woodworker can have is a nice flat bench in most cases, but when it comes to planing a piece of wood where we're putting a concave surface down on the bench, when that wood becomes reasonably thin, and most components for, uh, for furniture will be reasonably thin, when we put the plane on top, they will compress. And that makes it impossible to take away all of that curve because the pressure of the plane when you're planing can force that flat. So you take your full shaving from end to end, you think it's nice and flat. As soon as you take your pressure away from it, it springs back and it's bent again. So the trick to, to help with that is to support underneath. And I, I produced this from polystyrene, so it's a, much easier to demonstrate with. Uh, I'm going to be in trouble with the wife because there are bits of polystyrene all over the house now. Um, but I can support that by putting something underneath it. And that's a pretty good fit. And you'll see now that I can't compress that very much. Exactly the same is true with your wooden boards. You're unlikely to have that much concavity on it. So what I tend to use a lot of are these credit card blanks or membership cards, uh, reasonably thin plastic, probably about half a millimeter or so. Don't use embossed credit cards because uh, if you plane over those a lot, you could find that your credit card number ends up being embossed in reverse on the other side. But generally speaking, these work really well and you can slip one under a concave surface. Um, other parts of the board you might find See, that's working well for that one. You're then left with a gap between the high point and the lower point there. 
that can flex a bit. So maybe shims of a few thicknesses of paper in there will do the job. As long as you put enough supports in on the concave surface underneath, the convex surface on the top will remain stable and you'll better plane that nice and flat. Once you've got the top flat, uh, you can flip it upside down and get rid of the convex side. Because it's flat, you don't need any support on it. And you can just, just can be planing at either end. Now if we go back to this example here, if you try and plane a concave surface with, with a longish plane, the iron isn't going to be touching the actual surface for most of the cut. So it will cut right at the end, stop cutting, and start cutting again once you get to the other end. So if you keep planing, you'll be taking more and more off each end, gradually lowering it down so you end up with a flat edge. So let's look at our sawn board. We've got the rough sawn on one edge, rough sawn on one face, and then we've got the plain sides that came uh, that we prepared on the, uh, on the bigger donor piece. Let's take a look at that with a straight edge. You can see that this ruler pivots quite easily on this face, so it's obviously convex. On the sawn side, it doesn't rotate in the middle, it rotates at the ends, so clearly that's got a concave surface. And we can slip almost a credit card under there, certainly slip paper in that gap. So I'll flip that over and we want to take this plain side down so that it's now flat. As I say this will flex so let's put some support underneath. Credit card is just fitting under there. I want to put a bit more support, probably another two pieces here to stop it flexing. And I'll probably do some paper shims. So I've got some paper shims here and here. Got the plastic credit card shim in the middle. That's now not flexing, at least certainly nothing like it was before. Uh, so we can plane that flat. We do at the same time want to check for any twist and cup in the board. It's slightly high in the center. So we'll take a bit more off the center. We should also check for wind. So, sticks on like that. Well, no, not sticks on like that because as I just said, we're slightly high in the center. So that stick will rock. And if our winding sticks rock on there, we'll get an inaccurate uh, measure of that. So first of all, we'll make it concave within its width. So just a few shavings through the middle. And you'll reach a point where the plane really doesn't cut much more because the, uh, the edges of the plane are riding on the wood now and the blade's taken out. Um, a certain amount of material. And now you'll find it doesn't want to pivot in the middle, which means we can put our winding sticks on so that they don't wind, <laughs> so that they don't rock. Sight those exactly the same as I've shown in winding stick videos. And it is very slightly in wind, slightly higher on this side then on this side so high there high there low there and low there process of flattening is covered in 
in plenty of other videos that I've done. But basically we're just removing material from the high point and the intermediate points, but not the low point. So I'm high here, high there, low there and low there. So I'll take a stop shaving from here up to about here, leave that end. And then I'll take a stop shaving by leaving this end on this side of the material and going right through there. One right through the middle again, just to make sure we don't end up being convex across the, the board. That's almost perfect. Very small amount left, just high on both those corners. So I'll just repeat what I've done. And that's perfect. Now with the twist removed from it, we still have slight hump in there. So we'll take some stop shavings, leaving the ends as they are. So with uh, the wine taken out, we now need to take this slight hump out. So we'll take no shavings from each end. Just take a little bit through the middle. Now this is about as long a piece as I would tackle with a number four plane, um, at least in this way. With a four, you can probably flatten something that's up to about twice its length and it'll do a reasonably good job. Anything longer than that, you should go for a longer plane. So we've prepared this side nice and flat, also nice and smooth. Next thing then is to get the right thickness. Now it just so happens the other side is the sawn side. Um, if that had been the convex side, then we would have got rid of all the saw marks whilst we were flattening it. So to mark out for the thickness we want, we'll use a marking gauge. I tend to use what's often called a cutting gauge actually, so it's got a knife in it rather than a, just a point. So a little crescent blade in there. Set that to the thickness we want. As far as this board goes, I'm going to go for it's pretty much the maximum thickness that I can find on that board. I just test it everywhere. And this seems to be the, the thinnest point, so I'll clamp the gauge on nice and tight, tighten it up, and then score that all the way around the component. You'll notice I'm working with the stock of this gauge, so this, this lump here, the fence if you like, against the flat plane side. Just by eyeing it, I can see slightly more to remove here than down there. And there's more on this side of the board than the other side. Check our planing direction. You can see the knife line here at the top of the board showing the thickest amount of material that needs to be removed. So 
So I'm gradually coming down to a nice flattened area here. Saw marks are gradually going. We just continue to selectively plane until the knife line just crumbles away all the way around the edge. Eventually you end up with something which is lovely and flat. And the same thickness all the way around. And I definitely uh, recommend anyone who hasn't got a pair of dial calipers to get a pair. So now we've got a board which is flat on opposite faces parallel opposite faces and smooth opposite faces and actually the thickness that we want. We should check the planed edge to make sure that's still square. In this case it actually is. Now it could have gone out of square but that's pretty good. What I'll do is shoot that once just to make sure. There was a slight bit of twist in the wood so that should show itself as very slightly out of square somewhere along there. Uh, and we've got this rough side, uh, rough edge that we do need to now plane. And also what we want to do is bring it to the correct width. So first thing is I'm going to bring up what I call my Japanese shooting board. Now, not everyone's going to have one of these, not everyone's going to want one of these. Um, and there are certainly other ways of doing what I'm going to do. But what this allows me to do is support this board slightly above a rail here, uh, which is where I can run my plane. So running the plane on its side along here. I can take a shaving from the edge of this board and as long as I've set the, uh, the blade to be at 90 degrees to the surface here then I'll get a nice 90 degree edge to this, uh, this surface. This really is a nice way of doing it. And it will guarantee you nice square edges. But not everyone has one of these so what else could you do? Well, all you really need is a flat piece of board. Now here's a piece of MDF you can use instead of the planing board. It basically just sits on the bench, raises the work up a sufficient height, just hang that work over the edge, and you can plane that. Like so. Once you get a full thickness shaving, full width shaving, for the whole length of the board, you know you've got it at 90 degrees. As long as you've set your lateral adjuster on the plane so that the iron is cutting at 90 degrees to the, uh, to the board. Checking that, I can see that it's now lovely and square. I can use that edge now, which, let's give some terminology. This edge is now the face edge. This flat side is the face side. And we put our little mark on there like so. You're using the face edge and the marking gauge and set that to the width we want. And in this case, again, I'll go close to the width of the board. Scribe that around. Now I can take that, it's got a nice knife line which I can follow on the plane. Definitely wedge shaped here. So I'll be taking more off one end than the other with some stop shavings. We'll bring it down to that line, then we'll be the right thickness, we'll be the right width, and all we have to do then is cut it to length. Now when I was preparing the rough 
parts. I did say I was going to leave them extra long because this is the end of the board where it's been seasoned and sometimes you'll get some cracking there. So we'll remove the majority of the material from that end. So first of all, let's prepare the other end nice and square. Now, when I rough cut it, I was aiming for square, so I shouldn't be too far away. And I think a few shots on the shooting board should deal with that. Now this is my micro adjustable shooting board. That adjustment comes from just a little paper shim, which I can slide up and down the fence to get me exactly square. Obviously, when I made it, I glued the fence on, lovely and square to the edge, but over the seasons, it can change very slightly. And a couple of thicknesses of paper placed at the right point along here will get me exactly square. So let's start off and shoot that uh, sawn end. I'm going to use a number eight, simply because the heft of it is easier on the joints of my hand. I think I'm almost there. To make sure you're planing the whole of that end, just take yourself a pencil and uh, scribble over it. Once all those pencil marks go, you know you've, uh, you're hitting the whole surface. So I'm pretty much there. I'm gonna check, first of all, that I'm shooting square. And today's a good day, no shimming is required. I've still got a little bit of pencil on there though, so another couple of shavings, or just the one, has sorted that out. So we've got a square end. We can now measure to length. I'm gonna do that with a steel rule I tend to find that's slightly more accurate than using a, a flexible tape or something like that. Ordinarily, I tend to mark off measurements from one part to another. But for the first part, we've got to come from somewhere. And this was supposed to be 18 long. And what you can either do here is mark it slightly long with a pencil, square across, saw it, and then shoot it to exactly 18. Or you can mark it round uh, with a knife. So here you can see I'm abutting the workpiece up to the plane and also the steel rule up to the plane. And I can lift the rule up slightly so I can put my knife into the indentation. It was 18 inches and then put a mark on the wood. Then we take a square working off our uh, face edge Put the stock of the square up to there, put the knife in the mark, move the square up to it, knife a line across, and then we can mark that all the way around using the stock of the square on either the face side or the face edge and tracing that line round. As I saw up, to, sorry, as I plane up to the line, shoot up to the line, you can see that material just starts to break out as we get close to it, because it's cross-grained. As we hit the line, it ends up being lovely and clean. So here's our component blank completed. 
what we've done is taken away any bow, twist or cup to it. We've also planed it to thickness, we've planed it to width, and we've sawn and plane it, planed it to exact length. So it's a perfect component blank, ready for joinery. I hope you are too. And the next video uh, showing detailed techniques of the shelf build, what I'm going to be doing is showing you how to do a rebate uh, using both a rebate plane. I'll probably cover some other methods as well. So I hope you join me then. Cheerio.